But back we're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Transitional Justice. Today we're going to talk to uh, Dimitro Solodenko. Did I get that right? Solodenko, you know, now, who's in Kiev right now as we speak. And we're going to talk about uh, transitional justice in the context of human rights prosecutions in Ukraine. And there have been plenty of them. Welcome to the show, Dimitro. Good morning, Jay. It, it is nice to be here discussing important things. Yeah, tell us about yourself. You're you're a, a lawyer or a law student or a combination of the two. You're in school in Kiev, uh, and you're a member of Project Expedite Justice, and you're interested and committed to war crimes investigations and prosecutions. What did I miss? Yeah, so you're absolutely right. Right, I'm a combination of a law student. I still study at the for the master's degree, doing some legal science, but I am also involved with Project Expedite Justice as a junior junior uh, legal officer. But uh, I am also involved in uh, investigative part of our work, uh, and that effectively means that I also visit the field missions and try to help uh, with my in my capacity as a lawyer in documenting and given advice how to manage the evidence. You know, this, this is the first step in uh, bringing uh, those to the to accountability. So what do you do every day? Uh, mostly it's legal research, thinking about the legal arguments. Uh, so for example, now we are uh, investigating, gathering information on the blow of the Kachovka Dam. It's kind of difficult because you have lots of legal qualifications and uh, the, the, the norms, uh, the rules under which the perpetrators uh, could be liable, they have never been applied uh, in, in the ICC or before. This, this involves the proportionality. And uh, it, it, legally speaking, it's uh, really hard. To, to prove, and uh, there may be nuances, but yeah, generally, I think there is at least um, like a pre preliminary finding that there are all signs of the war crimes committed just because it was indiscriminate attack. They, 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 they started uh, an attack on the dam, and they know that they cannot control the consequences, and they cannot differentiate between military objects on the one hand and uh, the environment, the people, um, on the other hand. So I, I think there are signs of war crimes. Yeah. So was it that yeah, basically... The Russians denied blowing it up. You have to prove the Russians blew it up. True. Uh, I think, so I don't have access to intelligence. So, that's <laughs> because, so I, I cannot claim 100% sure, but they were in, contr in control of the dam. And that is kind of that circumstantial evidence. And I think our intelligence and, uh, yeah, the the atrocities mechanisms, prosecution mechanisms, they can find out the information. Yeah, I remember that was uh, what Zelensky said, that, um, you know, they were in control of it. it was, and why would in the world would the Ukrainians blow up their most important agricultural asset? Um, such a, a digression for a minute. How is that area doing now? Has Ukraine um, been able to deal with it? Has Ukraine recovered from the destruction of the dam? So the thing is, the, the, there is a, a big problem what to do. Uh, and that depends on the consequences. And wh wh when we are speaking about the environmental consequences, they are hard to calculate. They are hard to predict. So. From the start, everybody thought that uh, the area, the reservoir, uh, upper stream, it would it would be a desert and uh, it would spoil the land around. But the thing is that it, it it now appears that a big forest grow there, as it was before the reservoir and the dam were constructed. So it it, it have to change the plans. But you know, uh, our government, as I understand. In their plans is to rebuild the dam, but there are different perspectives in uh, civil society what to do. 
some some people some experts say that there is no need to restore the dam and we have just reoriented the agricultural sector uh, in the south and that's there are new ways in modern technology to bring water to the fields with the new pumping stations right from the river without the need to create uh, a reservoir so yeah we're in the process of recovering there is a lot of destruction and it takes time to recover that and uh, yeah there are lots of people who have suffered suffered so it may be hard to recover the human suffering in such a short time and uh, if we're speaking about the environment it's not even evident what is the recovery and what was the damage was yeah is agriculture coming back so it has it, it hasn't uh, uh gone down completely and it's an important part of uh, our economy uh, and it's among one factors which uh, holds it so it's operating and uh, yeah so ukrainian agrarians have already made some noises in the europe you know with poland and uh, hungary so i i think that's an indicator that uh, they're alive and make produce and try to sell it to those who need it you know, I told you before we uh, started the show that I was reading up on the uh, Holodomor, which was uh, Joseph Stalin's uh, effort in 1932 and 33 to intentionally starve the Ukrainian people so he could uh, settle it with Russians and make it a Russian-controlled area. Uh, and that was largely because he felt that this was the breadbasket of Europe and it was, uh, you know, especially fertile. And it was a great place for um, uh, him to control for agriculture. Um, but that was a war crime. And it strikes me that Ukraine has seen more than its fair share of war crimes over the years since, what, the 19th century, maybe? Uh, what do you think about that? Is that, is that in your, you know, your thought process about selecting this kind of career? Ukraine has had more than its fair share, including World War II, where the Nazis came in and uh, and they killed so many people. Um, how do you feel about that? Am I right? Yes. Yeah, so I I think it's even more than that. It's it's not only war crimes. And if you speak about the Holodomor, it's called genocide. The the crime of the crimes because somebody decides to kill. Uh, people or a group of people just for the sole reason they are who they are and you know it, it, it's like a special intent to destroy the group and it, so if we take the broader context for for the long times ukrainians were denied the right to be who they are and uh, people have suffered under the totalitarian regime it's it, it you know it's the under this mechanism under under this government you are not free to do what you want to do. It's common economy, common ideology. You cannot just decide, and that's kind of a trauma. I think it, it it's a group trauma because when people have freedom, they cannot properly use it. If we speak about the economy, you have um, the free market, where every, every process is decided by the market itself. And so th there is this transitional uh, moment that when people for all their lives, for generations, they, were not, they didn't have their free economy, not, not only that, but everything uh, politically was controlled from one place. From Kremlin, and that's a trauma, and and the people have to recover from that in generations. Uh, we call it in Ukraine like a Soviet mindset, and that's something that uh, partially passes to my generation. But we try to change that, to change our uh, approaches, and uh, that's that that's where the transitional justice starts in Ukraine. It's not about the Russian-Ukrainian conflict. 
it starts from transition from the totalitarian regime. And in this context, we have the uh, war with Russia now, because Russia resumed to be totalitarian, authoritarian, and uh, Putin could not see a free Ukraine uh, under his hand. And, uh, and he targeted us because an example of free Ukraine will raise lots of questions in Russia. And as soon as we have started our European path, path to freedom, he started to make in all these atrocities and launching the aggressions. And uh, I think that is really related. The conflict uh, with Russia is in the context of this post-authoritarian transition. And uh, we have to mind that. And a lot of in resolving this conflict depends on how we can uh, go to the end of the transition from the uh, authoritarian regime. Because if, if, if we uh, grow the liberal market, our liberal minds, we have more capabilities to fight Russia because they are authoritarian. Oh, that's a really, that's a really interesting perspective. For me, I now understand much more about what the word transitional means. But, but let me uh, let me ask you this: If if prior to uh, what February 2022, when this ridiculous invasion began, um, Ukraine was on a path of transition from earlier mm, genocidal times, whatever, uh, how far? down the road was it before Putin invaded you? Were you finished with your transition? Did you fully appreciate and integrate uh, you know, democracy, representative government, uh, freedom of, of, of the individual? Um, or were you still on the path where you had a way to go? So it may be shocking, but according to different researches, Ukraine have started democratic trans transition effectively in 2018. And we, we were really at the start. And uh, it, it coincides with the aggression because, as I have already said, Putin uh, noticed that we are not on the words to the way to the freedom, uh, liberal economy, liberal market. We are we are trying to do that already. And, and, and so we, we, we were at the start, it's, there, there's lots of things uh, to do. And that, that changed lots of time because, so if you look at the first presidents of Ukraine, they were from the uh, Soviet uh, and communist uh, party. The, the, if we speak about the second president, Kuchma, he was from the so-called red directors. It is the directors of the big fabrics. Uh, they have a kind of uh, businessman, not a big fabrics, factories. And the, he, he was, they were kind of businessman, Russian, uh, not Russian, Soviet businessman. And uh, they had all this common economy and they, they just did not know how to arrange a free market and uh, free society pro properly. And that's something really important because the thing I have just recently learned about the free market, how it works, is that there is as minimum government intervention as possible because there are no government interventions, then they bring uh, the un unintended uh, consequences for, for the economy. You set the minimum wage and uh, there is rise in the unemployment because... Uh, people with uh, low quality of their labor, they cannot find the job. And that's how it works. And when you have this common economy mindset, you just, you cannot people do what, what they want to do. You try to control everything that brings unintended consequences and that keeps you in, in, the, in the common economy. And that, that, that's what we have re re repercussions yet. Yeah. And, and I, I wanted to, to, to speak more about the persecution of human rights violations because that is an important factor of the transition. You no, know, because first of that, I, I think it's about the 
symbolic reparations for people, for 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 those who have suffered, whether that's the uh, um, authoritarian regime or the war crimes. What 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 victims are you talking about? The victims of the of Putin invasion, or before that? Um, what what's the body of victims that you are looking to represent? So that that's complex because, uh, as I have already said, these transitions are intertwined, and and we 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 could deal it like. Separately, I think there are three body of victims. Um, the first is the victims of the authoritarian regime uh, and the human rights violations there. Second is the victims of the revolution of dignity and the um, massacre uh, on my Maidan and the atrocities of the Yanukovych regime. For sure. And, and and the third is the victims of the war crimes. So speaking about the first two categories, uh, I I want to be candid here. And U Ukraine hasn't done all that it could. Um, I, I think there could be more effective um, like reconciliation or uh, commit some, some kind of commission of truth which could establish the facts about the atrocities of the Soviet regime in a clear word, in a clear procedure, procedure and that it would be like assess accessible to everybody, that we're not just blaming them, but there is a way or some document to clearly understand why it is clearly uh, Soviet regime was atrocious. I think we, we, we need some kind of that. And speaking about the... Um, Maidan uh, victims. Um, there was, I'd say, there was no effective um, investigations and uh, prosecutions for lots of reasons. Um, uh, a lot of people, a lot of these uh, pro-Russian activists, uh, they were uh, let go to Russia, uh, and uh, there was a lot of uh, delay because prosecution did not have capacity to investigate major cases. Everything was delayed, delayed. People were let go to Russia, and th there are no much results uh, yet. Some, 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 tri some um, verdicts in absentia. But is it sufficient? I think no. No, I think are, not, too. We, we have another, we, we have kind of another chance to change it with the war crimes, prosecutions. I see the positive dynamics here. As So I, I, I also work supporting the war crimes judicial education in Ukraine, you know, training judges. And uh, there is, so the National School of Judges do a lot of things uh, with, with the community of the donors uh, who help to, like the, uh, the companies from the US, from the UK who, help to educate Ukrainian judges. They, they undergo lots of training, uh, both theoretical and practical. And I, I think, and there are already not in absentia, but uh, live verdicts and people uh, who are serving sentences. Do you see yourself as potentially as a judge? Uh, so not yet, because the, the, the merchant of, Judging is something when you when you, you not only have to be a lawyer, but you have to be a wise person, and that, that's something that comes with age. Uh, age, because you have the evidence, you have the perpetrator, you have the victim, and everything is complicated. There is no clear answer because in real life, or life, there is not enough evidence always, and you have to make a judgment. A decision, a decision whether you believe this person has uh, committed a crime, and that that, that involve, uh, involves lots of uh, life experience and just mm. I, I, I I need more time to be prepared. Okay, well, I fully accept that. So, um, um, one couple of questions come out of that, and one is you speak of um, Ukrainian judges, Ukrainian courts. Ukrainian justice 
um, to deal with um, atrocities, war crimes, and the like. Um, do you prefer that? I mean, your view of it personally. Do you prefer that in lieu of, say, some other jurisdiction um, like the International Court, Criminal uh, Court? Um, or or um, would you rather keep it down at home? Is it better in Ukraine to have Ukrainians deal with Ukrainian atrocities? Yeah, so I think um, Ukraine and Ukrainian justice system is, shall be central. Just for, for a pragmatic reason that there is lots of atrocities. According to the prosecution, uh, 100, around 100,000 of um, incidents, uh, allegedly war crimes, were registered. No international mechanism can try all of that. Uh, and th 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 therefore, Ukraine and our justice system, we have lots of courts, lots of prosecutors, shall be central. And, you know, there is this complementarity principle with the International Criminal Court, which shall uh, hear only the most important and most serious cases. Just And, and that's reasonable because they have the better expertise. And, 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 and uh, when it comes to the interest of the international community, uh, the international community is interested to try the most uh, atrocious crimes. And so it's all the responsibility allocated between the domestic and international system. So when you're investigating and you go out and you talk to people and maybe videotape them or record them or take statements from them about about war crimes of which they are witness, um, are you are you collecting that for the Ukrainian justice system or for the European justice system? Well, whoever means that. So uh, the role of the NGO is to is not really to investigate in the formal sense, but to find information and map it. And you take the first general account of, of the of the person's experience. You you're not uh, you, you don't want to go into detail of his experience because it can be first traumatic. And uh, I, I I always try to like find the way that. The person is not uh, asked the same questions two times, or uh, re 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 reassessed, or reinterviewed, and um, too painful. It's, yeah, it's it's painful. So yeah, the thing, uh, uh, the NGO, they try to collect this, what what just person knows in general, and then the prosecutors and the investigators they go into detail, and uh, yeah. We cooperate both with domestic uh, prosecutors and with the international. So, Dimitro, you mentioned, um, you know, the um, two phases of Ukrainian history in which there were the communist phase, in which there were atrocities, and, and then the Maidan Square, um, which is relatively recent, in which there were atrocities. Um, and now the third one, you, you referred to it, is, uh, of course, the invasion by, by the Russians in um, 2022, which is still going on every day. And so uh, what I'm thinking is the war crimes that were brought to public attention, to the international public attention, um, because of the Russian invasion, may have an effect on the interest of the community in Ukraine and elsewhere, uh, to look back to the first two phases, where they might not do that had, had Putin not invaded. But his invasion and his war crimes and his genocide um, actually um, promotes the notion of looking back to phase one and phase two. Am I right? Absolutely. And he, here is when the importance of transitional justice comes. So uh, the not perfectness, or I, I'd say not completeness of the first two phases, I believe led to this third phase. Because if Ukraine could 
um, establish its um, free democracy at the start. It would be a lot, a, a lot, a lot more difficult uh, foe to fight for Russia. And mm. since 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 we really delayed this process, the transition, we had the second uh, transition because the democratic institutes defaulted. Yanukovych tried to bring the authoritarian regime back. And, uh, and uh, yeah, we have started another cycle of transition, but that was not, as I have already said, uh, uh, we have started really effective democratic transition in 2018, and that's pretty late. That's led to the third conflict. And th there shall be some um, um, conclusions done. What haven't we done uh, yet uh, before? And what we have to do now with this atrocities? I think that's really important. So actually, on this path, this transitional path, which you describe as sort of multi-phase path, um, the invasion of Ukraine accelerates your appreciation, the national appreciation of democracy and personal freedom. Um, it may not have been as as accelerated without without it. Uh, am I right about that? Yeah. So I think the human beings they like <laughs> studying by errors. <laughs> it's it's a trial and error way. That's sad because you need something really bad to uh, understand things, and that that's maybe about the just general public because. In our daily lives, we can learn things like beforehand, but educating the all of the people, the, the broad audience, you, you know, it, it, I think it takes uh, more of errors. No, oh, it's true, and we have so many problems, so much atrocity in the world today. And uh, you wonder, I wonder, whether the solution to all the atrocities that we see happening around us, including uh, in uh, in Israel, um, yeah. is violence. And that the only way to really deal with it and have people think clearly about it is to resolve it in violence like World War II. And you look back and say, gee, uh, we had some terrible dictators in World War II, and the way we got rid of that is through violence, through war. How, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think the solution to that would be just starting from ourselves, making our lives better, the lives of the people around us uh, better. And this small change, I think this can ultimately lead to positive change. That's my, that's my philosophy and my logic when, when, when I engage in all the things. So how's to... Zelensky doing, Dimitro? How's he doing? Is he is he moving the needle forward in terms of um, you know a better government, a better national consciousness in Ukraine, a better appreciation of uh, responsibility and accountability? How's he doing? Yeah. So speaking about the accountability, so it, it's hard to compare because a lot of his actions are driven by the unique circumstances. He cannot but respond to that. With, in some way and uh, so yeah there is a positive change uh, with the previous periods but you know it's hard to say whether another person couldn't do better or or worse than Zelensky I think and it's a lot of things depends not only on him but on his team and and uh, who, who is sitting in the prosecutor general's office who is sitting in the parliament who is sitting in the cabinet of minister? I think the the work of the president is not to not only to make decisions, but to build a good uh, a good team in the government. Sure. And and I think that something, yeah, at least partially, uh, the, there is now uh, uh, I believe more uh, open doors to good people uh, into the government. However, we have our problems with that. But that's another topic. Well, he's 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 preserved you anyway. He's protected you. He's uh, at least he hasn't you know given in and given up. Um, yeah. Another leader, another leader might have done that. You know? 
Um, the history will judge. Yeah. So let me uh, let me turn to something that you and I talked about before the show, and that is my concern about uh, war crime prosecutions, atrocity prosecutions, not just in Ukraine but elsewhere. Uh, you know, and and going to the very human uh, flaw about justice, about justice is only effective if it's done quickly. If it's done slowly, uh, it's denied effectively. The old, you know, the old aphorism, um, justice delayed is justice denied. And, um, you know, I think the problem is, and you mentioned it, uh, in the sense that um, the notion of transitional justice, the notion of accountability for atrocities, is still a new science. It has only been operating for a relatively short time in light of, you know, the sweep of history. And so my reaction is, can't we make this work faster? And I would appreciate your thoughts on whether we do need to make it work faster. And if so, how do we make it work faster? Yes. We, we, you're absolutely right. The justice uh, delayed is the justice not done. And, uh, and, and the thing is, it's hard to tell what, what would be an, uh, a false justice. Because, you know, when, when, when we're speaking about like ordinary domestic crimes, it's relevantly easy to investigate and prosecute. If we speak, for example, about the robbery, one victim. Uh, one perpetrator, uh, CCTV tape. You establish just the, the, who, who done what and you bring the person to accountability. And here we have the whole country, the, the whole uh, governmental mechanism at the perpetrator with all the resources. Uh, and it's just hard to or like really comprehend. Uh, how, how lots of people are on that side. And uh, you have lots of, uh, lots of going on in the, this process of atrocity. Lots of victims, lots of perpetrators. It's uh, scar scattered across the geographical area. And this, this is just really time consuming. And when, when, when you speak about the butcher, there is lot, mass graves. And compared to the robbery situation, and when you have the mass grave, it will naturally take lots, of, lots more time to identify the people, to uh, plot all the information in, a, in one piece, to track the uh, perpetrators, uh, to establish that not only the perpetrators, but the commanders and the common responsibility is another important important things because lots of war crimes are ha happening uh, with the acquiescence of the commanders and that's, that's, that's really important factor. So if we look at that, at that from that perspective, uh, I think there is not yet mm, uh, um, reasons to say that the justice for current war crimes is delayed. It takes more time. But we, we need to expedite it, and that's why our uh, project called Project Expedite Justice. Yeah. Mm. I, I, one time I had a joke that we, we are Project Expedite Justice, not Project Expectation Justice. So we just <laughs> identify the steps and uh, try to bring it. Uh, like you, you don't know the whole picture, but you know at least the next steps. Try to document everything so later when the prosecutors want to bring a case they have the materials try to speak with people because there is lots of trauma and uh, people just need like they n not all the victims need like money uh, in reparation it, it, it it's not it's not only about that because uh no money can cure all the problems and, and, and people need like symbolic reparations when they are treated like humans by the justice system, when they are 
when they have not an additional drama of speaking with investigators and prosecutors. That will be the huge success if, if, if this uh, system is more uh, victim oriented. And that's, that's something that uh, Ukrainian prosecutors are, are trying to do now. And, and, uh, and really there is a coordination center for victims created, the new strategies, and they trying to reapproach it. Well, you know, the fickle finger of fate moves on and people forget to, you know, for example, it is a war crime to kidnap children from Ukraine and take them into Russia and put them in schools and um, adoptive families that teach them to be Russian, not Ukrainian, and to lose their culture. It's part of, you know, uh, the destruction of a culture. And in, in five years, and it's been a year, two, almost. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's almost forgotten already, but they're there. And in five years or 10 years or 20 years, it'll be hard to mount a campaign, uh, won't it? Because they will already have been insinuated into Russian culture, and um, they may not even understand what happened to them when they were small ch children. So, you know, I think that the passage of time erodes um, the symbolism you're talking about. Do you agree? Yeah. So uh, the thing is, with, with, with the transfer of children, it's a hard and difficult situation because uh, it's true that under some circumstances, you have to transfer the children from the combat area. but it becomes a war crime when you deny the return of those yeah. children. And when you try to re-educate them, that's, that's, that, that becomes the war crime. So we should really think, and, and you made an important uh, notice about that they trying to re-educate and put in is lots, lots in uh, symbolism. It's something, it, it's something really interesting. And you know, Lots of his thoughts uh, are, are built on the uh, previous Russian philosophy, uh, which which are kind of so. Uh, the the Putin's favorite writer is uh, Ivan Ilyin, and and in and under some view he is a Orthodox Christian fascist. You know, and and, and there is lots of in what's happening in Putin head uh, head comes from. From, from that and the wrong interpretation. And it's, all, it's also important. I, I think here we have like the situation uh, of uh, Nietzsche and Hitler. Yeah, you know, yeah. And, and a crazy idea and a crazy interpretation and crazy uh, execution. Yeah, for things other than what they seem to be. So <clears throat> I, I'm just um, wondering about um, the the uh, uh, correlation um, between publicity of war crimes investigations, um, your work, um, to the world media, through the world media, and the repetition of those crimes. For example, and this is a wild guess, I would have imagined it after the coverage we saw on the murders in Buka that the war crimes by the Russians would have, at least to some extent, diminished. Uh, and that when the, when the press carries this and tells the world, reveals it to the world, that has a salutary effect. Um, the next time uh, Putin or his friends uh, would like to uh, kill people in the street. Uh, do, do you believe that's so? Have the war crimes that we saw you know, several months ago have they diminished because of publicity? Um, yeah, uh, I don't think um, they have diminished because of the publicity. First of all, because Putin does not watch TV. <laughs> he, reads, he, reads, he reads reports from, from the paper, which his uh, uh, subordinates give to him. It's, it's kind of there. I don't know whether it's true, but there is a suggestion that he do what he does just because he's fed with the wrong information, because subordinates fear to feed him with uh, wrong news. 
So I think it it does not play uh, uh, like it, it it does not play uh, in in a way to change in something the what what does Putin do. But you know, it's not only about Putin. It's about the system and just that country. There is lots of people who are able to commit atrocities, and that's what happens. And 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 I, I think it's it, maybe it's about the lower education, uh, you know, just uh, which which opens like the human instincts or or, or something like that. But but uh, generally, I think they are not really. First of all, they do not believe the uh, Western media. They say it's fake. And it's kind of, you know, they cannot accept that something like that is true because accepting that would mean the only thing you could do, leave Russia and try to change this regime, maybe sacrificing yourself. Not, that's a brave step. You recognize that, and because of that, they believe the fake news, and 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 because of that, um, I I think uh, hearing the news about atrocities in no way changes the situation in the field. Those who won't commit atrocities will commit them. Well, we're almost out of time. I have so many other questions for you, Dimitro. I hope we can circle back and and have a further discussion. But before we go, I would like to ask you, how are you doing? How are you doing in this work? And how are you doing as a Ukrainian in the middle of a war? Um, how do you feel about Ukrainian success in the war? How do you feel about the support of the EU and, and the US? I know that's a very compound question, and I, I'm not giving you a whole lot of time to answer it, but I just like your reaction. Yeah. So. The first part of it, how I feel as a Ukrainian in the midst of war, uh, I'm more like practical, uh, because right at the start I understood I understood that nobody can predict what will be going on, nobody can predict when the war will end, and it seems not to end in the nearest future. Maybe, maybe so it it could end tomorrow. But there is no, no, no. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you see, and yeah, even even in a year, there is no too much of that perspective. So uh, I, I I don't think a lot uh, far in the future. I I I like to think about uh, the today and what can I do today, and that's that's what I'm doing. Yeah. And uh, that leads me to how I feel in uh, in, in 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 this job. Uh, so first of all, I enjoy what I do, and uh, I think an important part of that is that it is really existential, as I have, I have already mentioned. I, I I I'm doing what I cannot but do, helping with my expertise. Good for you. You're the future, Dimitra. Thank Not you. only for Ukraine. Thank you. Thank, thank you for, for the support and uh, just, you know, uh, having such good minds with us uh, is really important. And having, having the healthy discourse and uh, discussing things and uh, this, uh, you know, like exchange of opinions, I think that really benefits us. And, and it was a pleasure appearing. It was a pleasure appearing and discussing this uh, transitional justice in Ukraine with you. Thank you so much, Dimitro. Really appreciate your thoughts, your discussions, and may I say, your service uh, to humanity. Thank you very much. Aloha. Aloha.